Thomas, finally we're together in chart. That's a very big thing. Big thing. Big thing for me. Big thing. On the right day. Tell us what day it is. Very big day. Well, it's the 24th of October. And the 24th of October in 1260. 1260 was the day the present cathedral, which everyone sees, was consecrated. consecrated. So it's the day of concentra consecration. It's the day of consecration. Right. It had been burned about 70 years before. Mm -hmm. The west facade was untouched. That's still the south from the mid 12th century, 1150 or so. But the rest, uh, including the towers, was part of the tower was left um, unscathed. So this is the day of what we see now. So for me, this is an important thing because I was very struck when I was here the first time. Mm -hmm. And then you and I started to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've been here and I've been here, but now we're here together. Mm -hmm. And all these interesting things have been happening as we came. We discovered we had friends also coming at the mm -hmm. same time. It's almost as though the, the clan is gathering, the, the tribe clan is, is gathering. gathering yes, yeah. well organized. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, before we start talking about the cathedral and, and the history of the cathedral, let's talk a little bit about the history of our conversations. Because mm -hmm. you and I met and we recorded a conversation in Zurich about Steiner, and then we did one on biodynamic farming. And you introduced the Soleri Report to, the, to the Rudolf Steiner and his work. And then I came to Basel and we had a wonderful conversation about the future of Europe. Then we had one on evil and you explained Ariman and the Aramonic forces and we talked about how to deal with evil. And then we just did a workshop in Basel, uh, which was very interesting and talked, uh, uh, we had done an interview on the story of Gideon and that was a very big, uh, had a very big impact on me because I have always loved the story of Gideon. It's my favorite Bible story, but you're the first person who picked up on it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it had a very great impact on me because unlike you, I didn't know the story very, very well. Maybe I have read it 20 years ago, but not really close. And so you made me reread and then I discovered the deaths and the beauty. And uh, I can immediately see how important the story for you is, because right. I think it's actually a modern story. Yeah. And we will talk about it, just to mention it's a Michaelic story. And we will see, that's why we will probably talk a bit about Gideon again in this talk. We will see uh, yeah. him on, in the cathedral. So that and means Gideon is on the cathedral. Yes, they, yeah. knew, they knew about this great figure. Yes. They knew about it. Yeah. So we're actually going to see uh, a university, I like to call it, in stone, with a lot of um, a wealth of uh, ideas, information, impulses. It's a, mu a musical thing, but let's wait for later. Well, let's talk about the history of Shard. Okay. So, um, the, the amazing thing about the cathedral is it, it brings together so many different threads of Western history and Western culture. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the beginning because before Chartres was a cathedral, this area and this place had a long spiritual tradition with the Druids. And I mean, it's really was a Celtic. Yeah, a Celtic, uh, which means a spirituality that is more cosmological, which was not annihilated by the Christians. It's a Celtic background and this Cathedral was built on a promontory which has partly an interesting mixture of stones, partly lime, partly um, granite. And it was a cathedral which was never for the dead. There is no single um, Yeah, tomb. there's no tomb. No tomb. It's a life cathedral. And that's why it is also dedicated to the life-giving Virgin Mary. Right. It's a life place. And the Druids were here and the stream of the Turium movement, the stream of the Grail movement, both met here. Yeah. 
and the Roman Catholic Church was not key here. So Joseph, it's Joseph of Aramea? Yeah, yeah. Came, and that was when it was consecrated to Mary, and then he went on to Glastonbury. Yeah, but that was long before. Okay. That was, that was at the time of Christ. He was the right. one who was standing, that's the great story in it. He was standing across, um, underneath the cross, and wanted to get the permission to get some drops of the blood. Right. And this became the Holy Grail vessel with the Holy Blood. Right. So this is here, and the, the Arthurian stream is here, which is also linked to Glastonbury and Tintagel, etc. So you have a focal point of very different streams that have all in common a spirituality which is concrete, and cosmological oriented and nothing to do with institutions to begin with. So one of the things I love about Chartres and the cathedral is you feel when you're in it that this has been created and evolved and developed by the people who support it. So when you look at all the fantastic, beautiful stained glass windows, almost all of them have a little part of the window where donors. it shows who the donors were. The butchers, yeah. the bakers, yeah. the farmers, the yeah. bankers. And so you see all the different groups of people who make up the community are... United. Particip so, uh, and you always point out that there's never been an official visit of the Pope here. No. So it's the people's church, Whereas and it's a living the popes church. have visited almost every other great place in Europe right. and left its mark, you know, but here? The Pope was here. Yeah, the Pope was here. <laughs> it's a little... <laughs> right. Anyway, so it's it's got a very interesting history. Now, you see when you, uh, when you look at the portals, you pointed out about the university here. When you look at the portals, it's not just angels. It's Aristotle. It's Plato. Mm. It's Enoch. It's Gideon. It's... Uh, this is really, there are many threads dedicated to higher learning. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a church which is celebrating knowledge. Yeah, knowledge of, uh, from the point of view, it's celebrating, you could also say, conscious development. It's right. not static. The, the whole message, in a way, can be summed up. The human being can develop, should develop. The seven liberal arts is just one field. It's right. important. We will see the portal later. And this is a this is a path of development. Knowledge, yes, but knowledge as knowledge is not just the main point. Like knowledge today. balanced. Balanced and as an ability to move on and to expand. You have never here the mentality of specialists who, who know one field and don't know everything else. Right. Anything else. Well, everything's so integrated. Everything comes together. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's one scholar I wanted you to talk about who uh, was, wasn't he there at the time of the consecration? Who, who was that? Abbas. Abbas? Alano Sabinzelis? Yeah, Al yes, Alano Al Sabinzelis. No, he had died in 203 already. Ah. Right? No, no, not 203. 1203. About, okay. He was in the spiritual world. But here is a ring. The, the high point of the school of Chateau had a, a great radiation, a spiritual radiation, even influencing, inspiring people who were never here. Mm -hmm. So the high point ends with the end of the life of Alanus, who died in 1203. And yet the radiation of the school goes on. And for me, that was a riddle for a long time. School is over. Why is the radiation going on for half a century? Mm -hmm. And I came to the surprise explanation for myself. It is the building who is kind of like an extract of all the spirituality, which right. itself had the It has the field. It, it kept that field. Yeah. So even because at the same time of the consecration, in the same year, I believe, there was a man who was never here who became the teacher of Dante, Brunetto Latini. In 1260, when the consecration was here, Brunetto Latini had a kind of a 
initiation walking in nature. Had a light sunstroke and then he saw the elementals, the um, spirit of nature. That was at the same time of the consecration. So you can see this consecration renewed in a way for, for maybe half a century the radiation of the uh, school. Also the main teaching people here had gone, the right. spiritual world. Right had gone up, I would say. At that time, going up doesn't mean going away totally, but then they became inspiring helpers from above, so to speak. Now, there's a tradition of Americans coming to Chardon, and yes. Henry Adams is one of the ones that you put me on to. We talked about it in the future of Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, as we were driving along in the car, I was reading to Henry Adams to all my mates. He is amazing, and I think he can only be understood if you have the spiritual concept of reincarnation, which in Charter was there in the background. It wasn't very explicit, but it was there. Uh -huh. So Henry Adams has a European soul, right. in a way. And he said, um, I remember the day when I was in Paris at the feet of Master Abelard. You know, he, he, he writes like he had been present at the time. Right. And that gives the liveliness of his writing. Right. And this is, for me, a great thing that you have American people who, who made um, a political career or he, did, he was not a political uh, man himself. Yes, he was to a certain degree, but no career. Uh, that have this interest in European deep spirituality. And from that point of view, maybe we can now mention. Yeah, so I discovered on the way here because, you know, it's my habit to read and study on my way to a place. Mm -hmm. I discovered the story of Wellborn Griffith. Extraordinary. Unbelievable. <laughs> Extraordinary. So without Wellborn Griffith, we wouldn't sit here and have this talk about Charter. Exactly. Because Charter wasn't, wouldn't exist. It was going so, to be bombed. So Can before tell we the tell the story of Wellborn Griffith, one of the things that you have said to me many times whenever we talk about chart is that it's a story of individuals of individuals who make connections, build things, teach others, and you keep seeing the thread of this individual and this individual and this individual and how it builds. And, and this fits right in because Wellborn Griffith proves the remarkable things that one individual can do. Absolutely. Yeah. He was, I have to say, Wellborn Griffith was from Hardeman County, Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm from Hardeman County, Tennessee, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember that. But he, uh, it was during the Battle of Chartres. So why don't you tell the story? Yes. Yeah. You? You. Me. Well, all I know is he was a lieutenant and uh, he heard that. I think he was a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel. I think so. And his army leaders had a plan to invade Chartres and bomb it if necessary. And he heard that and was shocked and said, he went to his uh, superior and said, you can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, men and wars come and go, but a cathedral like this is for, so to speak, eternity. You can't do that. And then he asked whether they lent him a jeep. Yes. Yeah. His 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 commander said. His commander. The Germans are using it as a headquarters. Exactly. So he asked for a jeep yeah. and a driver, and they would go and drove, risk their life. Yeah, very dangerous. Drove behind the front. And to prove that there were no Germans. Went in, went up, came back and said nothing. They are not there. And saved the cathedral. Saved the cathedral. Yeah. Then he was called to service in the afternoon. He went back to his division. Right. And he was killed the same afternoon. He was killed. So that seems really that was the fulfillment of a mission that right. he was coming down with. And uh, otherwise he would sit here. It was, he would have gone. So there is a protection here. Yeah. This is a protection. And it reminds me of um, like the mysteries of Hibernia and Ireland. We almost know nothing externally. They were well preserved and protected. And in Charter there's a protection. That's why the popes didn't come here so far. <laughs> well, the new one might, might, might make a change. We hope not. We hope not. <laughs> it's not necessary. No, well, it's it was, so part it's, of it is such a live, this is a church that's so alive. I assumed when I came here that it would be a big tourist attraction. 
I didn't understand that it's a working church. No, it's not a church. Yeah, it's a yeah, working yeah, church. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, people yeah, yeah. are coming for services yeah. and their weddings and baptisms and organ concerts. Yeah, great. Con it's got a fantastic organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's to be hoped that it stays as long as possible, and many people could get through this architecture to the lively spirituality that has a long future because it. There were people who saw that materialism is coming here. They right. prepared it in a way because materialism was necessary. Right. But what was also necessary is to go beyond it again. And this was when the time of Michael started in 1879. Right. And the greatest teacher here, Alana Sabinsolis, knew this. So imagine you have a person... He was the, worried about materialism yes. and what it would do. That's why he was preparing the possibility that people would go beyond at the end of the 19th century again, rise up, which partly has happened, but in a larger part not has, has not happened yet. But to come back to the, what you rightly stressed, the individuals is very important here. And the deeds and the connections. And one of the connections is in the origin of this church, you had three other places in, in Europe that were pioneering this sort of Gothic architecture. The first one was Saint-Denis near Paris. Have you ever been? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you looked at the windows and so? Yeah. They are wonderful. And you had a, a, a one man there. This was Sugerius or Suger, mm -hmm. the abbot. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of Bernhard of Clairvaux, yeah. the great mystic who was um, connected to the Templars, to the kings. He was a really right. interesting individual. But he didn't like the idea that people, by going into places like Saint-Denis with glass windows that was projected, he thought they would be distracted. He thought the spirituality would be distracted into art. And Suga said, no, my dear friend, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we are going to do here. Yeah, and because Bernhard didn't like this. It, when, you, when you look at the great stained glass windows of Chart, it yeah. shifts your yeah. mind up. Yeah, and yeah. the colors. And Suga's program was the colors are in a way reflecting the nine hierarchies above us. Mm -hmm. They knew the hierarchies. So Suga was in a way, he started by rebuilding the choir in Saint-Denis. That was the beginning of the Gothic. Right. And that was about five or ten years before Chartres started, uh -huh. before or while Sass uh -huh. started, and when Canterbury started. Uh -huh. And there are sometimes the same people who were acting as architects in these three places. So you had an international community of individuals. Yeah. And one of them was... Um, who came here was uh, another teacher of Charter, Garrido, in his wonderful book here. This is a wonderful book by uh, a man who knew some pupils of Steiner's, who knew a man who knew Steiner, a French engineer, who told him about the secrets of Charter. Right. And so there's a personal succession line of people who know best about this place here. And here's one. It's a very, very good, uh, good read. And he talks about the teachers like Alanis of Insulis, we're coming back to him. But now having said there is a connection to Sans, Saint-Denis and, and uh, Canterbury, I want yeah. to tell you the Canterbury story. Uh, one of the teachers of Chartres was before that a friend and uh, secretary of, of uh, Thomas Beckett. Right. He was one of the, and what did Beckett want? He wanted to have um, independence of the church from the state, from the king, a very modern thing. Spiritual life cannot be um, uh, run by the political life. This right. is not true. It must be free. And Beckett was a forerunner of this. If you compare with the, the problems today, we have a, a man like Erdogan who does completely the opposite again. Right. Although his forerunner um, Atatürk was having the same impulse to separate. Yeah. So Beckett was in that sense a modern man. He was the friend of Henry II, the king, 
And the king thought when his friend, who was his chancellor first, is made the archbishop, he will have him in the pocket as arch archbishop, and that the ruler, Henry, could rule the church through his friend. Mm -hmm. And the friend said to him, I warn you, if you make me archbishop, I have to serve another lord like Gideon. Right. And this he did. And so he, he won, in a way, the independence of the church from the political system from the king. The king hated him for that. And he stimulated some people, ah, if we would get rid of this Beckett, uh, uh, things would go better. So that's the background of the murder in well, the somebody, cathedral. Somebody rid me of the... Yeah, yeah. exactly. Later yeah. he said, no, no, that was just in anger and so forth. It led to his being murdered in Canterbury. Now, one of the persons who were present there was his friend and secretary, John of Salisbury. Mm -hmm. After the murder, only after the murder in 1170, uh, he came over here. He had been here before, but he was not connected to the church. But then he was called to be the bishop of Chartres. Mm -hmm. That's why he came over. Only, I think, um, 1176 or so. And the important thing why I tell the story is, as he was a witness of this atrocious murder in the cathedral, he was the one who collected some of the blood mm -hmm. of his beloved friend and took it as a relic, as a magic relic when he came here. So you have this relic of um, uh, Beckett in Chartres, and one day, I have to tell this story if you're okay. Yeah. One day, um, an incredibly interesting story happened, which is not known. It's not known. It's not in this book. I have looked at it. I don't know why people don't look at it. There is a letter by John of Salisbury to uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury after the murder. And he says, Dear Richard, I think it was a Richard, I have to tell you the following story. We had here some masons masons who made mm -hmm. the and uh, there was a scene that one of them said now stop with this saintliness of this Beckett I'm sick of it it's <laughs> it ruins my appetite it is terrible and his friends were all shocked and said do you know what you're saying this blasphemy is it's terrible and then he said I don't care now if you if your Beckett is worse what you think he is then he can turn the food in my mouth into poison and he can make me mute. He put some food into his mouth, it was uh, lunchtime, and immediately it turns very bad. He gets ill, he can't speak, and they have Whoa. to carry him home. Whoa. He was a paralyzed man. And nothing helps. They bring him to the cathedral, um, let him touch the garment of the Ma of Mary, which is one mm -hmm. of the holy relics here. Didn't help, nothing. At the end, someone says, we have to tell the bishop, but he was out of town. So someone was sent to him and he came and he looked at this poor creature. And then he said to someone, please get the, the file, file, the little vessel. Thing of blood. With the holy blood. So they brought it. He washed, um, he washed some um, um, a holy also relic from the Beckett time, a little uh, knife in the water in which the phial was put. And after a while, he asked the man who's still mute, now drink this water. And they had some prayers, of course. Please, um, Holy Spirit of, of Beckett, heal this man from this blasphemy with demonic uh, effects. He drank one gulp and then he said, oh, thank you. Uh, thank healed. you. He could immediately speak again. And then he said, well, I will now go to Canterbury to his tomb. This is a real story which showed 
the mentality of that time and that such a relic blood is a special thing. Right. And the blood relic is has a, a string to the individuality that right. was the carrier of this blood. Right. So this story shows not only the connection of two countries like England and France, but through Beckett and Salisbury, there is a live, living spiritual thread also to the realm of the departed. Right. We are going to see a little um, um, writing on the wall, mm -hmm. which knows that these two people are here. Yeah. So this shows the cosmopolitan and the spiritual influence, which goes far beyond only having good people here, but they have a work with the dead. This is something for our age. Right. We need to cultivate a cooperation with the dead in a free way. Yeah. All the more that we the know ancestors. that in some lodges. Yeah, and uh, what's the expression you always use? We wear dwarves who stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. Yeah. That is actually reported by John of Salisbury in one of his writings. Yeah. It's not by him. It is by one of the teachers who was a great teacher. He did not write one single line, but he was laughed by everyone. It's one of the reasons I get so angry when somebody says, why is nobody doing anything? Because in fact, we're lifted up by the all the yes. contributions and streams that have come before us. Yes. Yeah. It needs that our, our ego is able to admire what others did and that we think we just go on where they have uh, been leading us. Right. We need a certain recognition and gratefulness. Yeah. And today, this is all suffocated by the mentality of individual ambition. <laughs> I'm the well, I, don't, I, isn't it? I have no objection to people being ambitious. Well, you know, you want to you want to accomplish, you want to contribute. There is a healthy ambition, I agree. Yeah. But if it leads that you only see your own your own purpose in life, then you can't link to what others have done. Yeah, you can't access it. Then you would say, I'm not standing on any uh, giant. Where is a giant? But the the contributions of our ancestors are real and we can access them. In other words, they have power. We can access yes, them. Yes. Right. And then we, we need what is a, a spiritual virtue for today also. We need what is called in spiritual science historical conscience. Right. We are not just here and nothing has gone before, but we have to take up the threads. And now we are just trying right now to take up a few threads of this wonderful yeah. school of Chartres yeah. to make it fruitful. So, yeah, but that's may, what... may I add just yeah. one thing? One of the things we can learn today from these people and the Beckett uh, Salisbury episode with the healing shows that is to work with veneration, admiration, with the dead we appreciate because there are whole groups today who work with the dead in a very Arimanic way. Right. Western Dangerous. logic. Western right. logics. They know there is not anything if just finish after life, but they want to use the powers of those just for power ends. In a dark way. In a dark way. Right. And those who are inspired by that, they don't even know that. Right. You know, um, if you are in a certain occult um, community, these forces can be led into you. And so you might give a, a speech that is not very intelligent compared to a speech of some other people, but it has an effect. And the reason is you are the carrier of will forces. Right. You're not wiser and you're not more moral, but you are more effective. Right. Because of that right. abuse, there should be more people who have this Attitude, and this is one of the great key things that's maybe not all our hearers know the story. The, um, we are like the quote, the famous, that shows the central mentality in this school of Chartres. This is said by Bernhard of Chartres and says, we are like dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. And second part, if we see a bit further than they did, it is only because we are lifted up by the by them. And this shows you the whole mentality of individual and a social element. 
they, they never felt alone. They felt in a community right. with those beyond or say with those now up in the spiritual world. Right. That is modern and that we have lost and that we have to regain. And mm -hmm. that is some, some of the things we could learn here. It's very interesting. Um, we recently, we just had an interview with John Rappaport on imagination and Leonardo da Vinci. And he has a very famous recording that I love where he talks about how Merlin was concerned that, that people would turn to materialism and lose their spiritual power. Yeah. And he created the story of Camelot and the, the legend of Camelot yeah. so that they would have a way to come back and access what had been at one point very real. And it's very much like what we're talking about with Chartres is trying to preserve something here so that when people are ready, they can come back and access it. Yeah, they can right. pick it up and further develop it. Right, yeah. it's like a well exactly. where they can drink when they're yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah. By so, the way, may I add, uh, I, I usually don't do that. I don't usually make, um, uh, what is it called, public relations for my own works. Yeah, do, do, no, do. No, this story I have told you is so important. Yeah. It's so unknown that I just want to make clear there is a little booklet with the whole scene, you know, on this uh -huh. uh, healing, blood healing. This is, we're going to see this window in the cathedral, uh -huh. the murder in the cathedral. This window was uh, inspired by the friend of Beckett after his murder. He thought we right. have to have a Beckett window here because right. of this lively um, um, uh, situation, this connection. It just is nothing. Right. And it's based on an authentic letter that has never been understood that was it what it was, namely showing that the dead could also work in under certain circumstances as a healing force and right. so on. So this lived here. This is, uh, you published this in 2014. Yeah, right. 2014, it's a little play. We actually yeah. uh, brought it out in Basel. Uh -huh. People were quite interested and uh, it was fun for me to make an artistic thing on a historical basis. The Age of Michael. Yes. Let's switch. We're in the Age of Michael. Explain what that, explain Michael, introduce Michael and explain what this means. Ha. Huh. What a job. Yeah. You have three minutes. Thank you. I got three minutes. Did you hear that? Good. No, there are seven archangels of time, uh -huh. seven time spirits. Um, some are known, some are not so known. Orifiel, Anael, Sahariel, Raphael. Raphael was the time ruling spirit in the time of Shatra, and he stands for healing spiritual healing. Then came Samael, Mars, they're all related to the seven planets. Then comes Gabriel, and then comes Michael. So and the two towers are chart, one is Gabriel, one is... That's right, one is Michael. So they had a Michael relation to begin with, because when one of these archangel of time is ruling, the others play in the background, like in an orchestra. Right. But there came a time where Gabriel became time spirit from 1500 onwards and till the, till the new time of Michael, Michael had to be silent. He couldn't do anything because he cannot, like before, let his influence flow into the hearts and spirit of men because right. he, is the, he is the waiting spirit who can only show the way he cannot have a direct effect. And in that time, after Chartres, he made a school in the spiritual worlds for the departed souls who were there, you and me and many, at different times. And when he came down, he became the archangel of our time. And you can sum up his mission for human beings, find the thinking, the spiritual through the thinking that has been developed and one-sidedly used for natural science. Use this thinking power to understand the rich world of the spirit. Don't just be happy with mystic or believing, but have a sense of 
exactness and spirit, spiritual differentiation when, we, when you go to think and talk about spiritual matters. Mm -hmm. So he wants us to be thinking beings, but who think about the spiritual. And he wants us to be courageous beings like Gideon. Yeah, so, so Michael's very courageous. He's the courage angel. But the courage of what we need today is a courage of cognition. Right. There is a lot of Break the trend. cowardice of right. cognition. People say, oh, I don't want to know this. There is oh, I not... would say people are losing their minds. Even worse. Yeah. And the trance, we're in the trance. Do you mean the gender thing or what? Well, you know, I th well, I think there's a tremendous amount of entrainment and mind control. Yeah. And propaganda, and, yeah. but, you know, but there's a madness. It's a madness. And the Arimanic powers, Michael has one great enemy, that is Ariman. Mm -hmm. This is on a medium range in the spiritual world, if you like. When you go right. high up, there is unity, there is harmony. That's very important mm -hmm. to see that. But there is a spiritual battle behind our time. They were aware in Shatra, you know, Alana Sabinsoli has written a great book called, well, the, the title is, is, is not important, um, misleading. The theme is how to make a new human being for the future. And there was a council, a spiritual council, talking about this. Mm -hmm. And Michael comes in at the end, but he has also the idea there was a counter council, subterranean, with the Arimanic forces right. already in the 12th century, they knew there will be a great impulse, a Michaelic, for renewing the human being. But there is a counter impulse from the Arimanic forces. Right. That's the, for me, I mean, you know all about these economic uh, lies and political battles, but the basic battle, and you know about the this spiritual. as well, is a spiritual yeah, battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need courage of Cognition. Yeah, Michael allows you to think so clearly yes. and powerfully. Yes. No matter what. Yes, no right. matter it's what. But many people it's like are a sword. Some, yes, but yeah. many it's people. It's like a mental sword. Yeah, I totally agree. Right. So that's wonderful that they have out of this background this a figure like Gideon, you know? Right. And it's just one little detail. Now this was the huge insight that I never had was that Michael was the presence at the story of Gideon. Yeah. So tell us about that. Well, he was the leading. A time spirit has sometimes before another task to be the spirit of a folk. Right. And Michael was the leading spirit of the Jewish people. Right. For centuries. Right. And um, at the time of Gideon, he was the folk spirit. Right. Already at the time of um, Joseph. Which makes sense because, of course. because if you listen to the story of Gideon, and I would just encourage anybody listening to this to go back and hear our interview, but if you listen to the story of Gideon, you're talking about someone with a relatively small group of people achieving an extraordinary victory with through ex very high integrity. Yeah. So you need that. Yeah. courage and you need that clarity and you need the ability to cut right through the trance. You need the courage to be a minority, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. And not think you're failing because you're only few. On the contrary, yeah. the homeopathic concentration can be much higher. Yes. That's why we shouldn't uh, strive to have as many people as possible in an audience, but the right ones. When I was an investment advisor, many of my clients wanted me to help them come up with a plan to protect them against risk. And you need this money to protect against that risk and this money to protect against that risk. And finally, what I, I kept trying to communicate was in a world where risk is rising and you have a spiritual warfare, the first way to protect against risk is to have spiritual protection. And that is the most efficient kind of you know, because spirit, if you have spiritual protection, if you need to the move to the right, you'll move to the right. You'll yeah. know to move. Yeah. You know, it's a source of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a wonderful story on spiritual protection that I want you to tell. 
because it's such a great example of this. Many stories. Which one do you know? The one about the man in the bed. Oh. The man in the bed. <laughs> she picks up stories that are three days old and then I have to tell them. <laughs> okay, fine. This is a wonderful story. It comes yeah, from it a is. Norwegian man who was a, a Waldorf teacher. A man comes home, tired, opens the first door of his small apartment, goes in, opens the second door to his bedroom, shrieks back because someone is in his bed lying. And who is this someone? He himself. And he can't believe his sight. He goes out, closes the door, thinks maybe he makes like that, you know, am I, am I okay? Am I dreaming? Uh -huh. No, I'm not dreaming. So he makes another go very, very cautiously, opens the door again, looks at the bed. The man is still there. He is lying in the bed. That's enough. He closes the, board, the door probably very quickly, goes to a friend and says, dear so-and-so, have you got a place to stay for me tonight? He doesn't say more. Of course, come in, come in. Maybe he has a coffee or something. And the next morning they have breakfast. Then the, the one who comes to his friend says, can you please come accompany me to my home? And then he starts giving hints, but not the full story. They go in, he opens the door again very cautiously, and then he sees on this bed was a huge oven collapsing in the night. And it is totally clear to both men, he would have been dead in the morning if he would have stayed in the bed with this right. man, that would have been possible. This right. So that shows, of course, uh, protection. The question is, who fabricated his double, so to speak, there to protect him? The angel, I don't know. But that could be a... I don't know. It's, you know, it's I've, a wonderful I've experienced spiritual protection so many times yeah, yeah, yeah. that I don't, I can't tell you where it comes from. All I know is it's real. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you have it, you know, there's not enough money in the world to protect you in the way that it can protect you. Of course. Yeah. Money can only protect you to a certain degree, and that's the end. Now, shall we go back to Shafra, or is yes. that the end? No, no. What is the time? No, yeah. no. Do we have a little we bit have of time? Yeah. We have time. Now, I, I'd like to give you another story of uh -huh. Alanus of Insulis, uh -huh. who was probably the most far sighted person in the Shafra time. And the story goes, he was already elderly. He wants to give a lecture about a very high spiritual subject. Namely, he wants to talk about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. You can't hardly go higher, I suppose. Right, the Father, the Son, the Holy exactly. Ghost. Okay. So he prepares himself in walking at the board of the river board of the Seine, meditating and so on. There he sees a little boy. What does the boy do? He has uh, dug a hole in the sand next to the river, and he goes with a little bucket to the river and puts water into his hole. Uh -huh. And then uh, Alanis asked this boy, what are you planning to do here? And the boy said, well, I will put the sand into my hole here. Just take some time. I will put the sand into my in my hole. And Alana said, but my dear boy, that can never be done. You will never end this. And the boy says, I will rather end this than you will end speaking about the Trinity. <laughs> so Alana is very impressed, uh -huh. goes home, thinks a lot, goes to the church, goes up the, what is it called, the pulpit? Or, yeah. yeah and says, today it must suffice that you have seen Alanus. Then he goes away again. He doesn't speak. Today you must be content with seeing Alanus. And he doesn't give his talk because the boy made clear to him that's such a high impossible task he said to himself, don't think you can easily manage and give a speech about that. It shows his humbleness. 
and it shows in a way people were of course impressed why does Arlanus not give his um, talk that is the reason he realized that this talk is such a high deep subject that it prefers to be silent then he goes into a monastery he's an old age Cistercian there he dies he becomes a Quaker he lets everybody think themselves <laughs> he shuts up <laughs> and this was the boy's teaching oh good lord Okay, so I want to don't talk... don't like the story. Well, it, if you grew up as a Quaker, where you had to do all the work yourself on <laughs> Sunday... <laughs> Maybe talk about the seven liberal arts quickly. Yes. Aristotle. We will see. Yes. In the main portal, they have Aristotle. In another portal, you find Aristotle. Some people say historians, the school of Charter was Platonist which is true, but they don't have a Plato around. Why don't they have a Plato around? I think the explanation is they were so platonic that they needed the complementary inspiration by Aristotle and Aristotelians right. that were right. up in the spiritual world. Right. That's why they put him and not Plato. They had Plato within themselves, Aristotle was up there and they right. wanted to show their connection with what was going on up there. Right. And he was the great teacher of dialectics. This was the name for logic at that time. So they practiced logic, clear thinking, grammar, understanding right words, and so right. on. Um, all connected to planets. Music was the sun. No, music was Venus, I remember. No, it's the sun. No, no, no. Grammar is the sun. Oh, sure, it was the well, sun. Well, if he says I'm this here, check. that's a rubbish <laughs> line. Oh, he's wrong? Yes, he's wrong. He's, he's wrong. wrong. No, sun is the word, you know, the logos. Here, music, sun. Yes. Well, uh, we're asking to correct him in this spiritual <laughs> world right now. No, it's not. Uh, I, I can, you know, the holy word, the logos, mm -hmm. is the sun. Right. And grammar was, so to speak, uh, the logos teaching on earth. Anyway, as he says, grammar is the moon. Yeah, that's. He's wrong. He was a dear friend, but I, <laughs> I have to contradict him here. <laughs> I think he's ready for that. Yeah. Anyway, it's the planet. The main thing is these seven arts are a path through the planetary spheres, Venus or Sun, no matter. And then you come to the zodiac, and this is the the soul has to. Sorry. The soul has to do with the planets, the spirit has to do with the zodiac and what is beyond. So there was a, a, a way of leading the souls through the planetary spheres and their impulses in order to come to the higher. And the higher started with philosophy. They right. thought some, some person who hasn't gone through these seven arts is not fit for philosophy. Right. This was a very rigorous teacher teaching, and many people taught that in, in Chartres, in France, in Orléans. And this is also something we have to come back to a teaching which is much more universal than what we have at the present university, and is also spiritual. So I want to talk about why Chartres is so, it's like a well that we can drink at now. Yes. Because, and we talked about this at our, the workshop that we did in Basel this Sunday. Um, I grew up, you grew up in a world where an individual was sovereign and was guided by divine authority. And our freedom in the United States, for example, we believe our freedom comes to us by divine authority. Michael is the very much an angel of freedom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet we see what is being promoted today is not a vision of a human as an individual who's sovereign under divine authority, but really a human is a natural resource who can be manipulated and changed from a man yeah. to a woman or a woman to a man. And, yeah. and you know, they're like an oil deposit. Absolutely. That's the technocracy vision. Yeah. And one where, you know, humans and robots, there's gradation between them and they can be managed in the same way and they're kind yeah, of the same yeah, thing. Yeah. A human's a computer, you know. And, um, and so 
it comes down to each one of us. Are we going to adopt the culture of subhuman? We call it, you call it, you don't call it transhuman, you call it subhuman, because that's what it is, it's subhuman. Are, subhuman you going to, yeah. are you going to practice in your words, your thinking, your daily life, the culture of subhumanism? Are you going to reach and access that divine protection? Yeah, yeah. Of course, you should do the second. And uh, that is also said in the words by Steiner, you quoted before, maybe you could at the end bring them in. Right. Yes. Because a one-sided spirituality is getting luciferic. Right. And uh, that's not what we want. That's not Michael. Right. But we could say um, those forces, like the Arimanic, who are against all the ideals of Michael, um, they want us to forget, to forget the past, to forget that there was a pre-earthly life in the spiritual world that we should try to get a faint consciousness again, that there was a life in past incarnations. There was a first incarnations, which we, which were we, we led out of the paradise. You have wonderful stories of the paradise in the cathedral. Right. I show you one where you see God has Adam as a thought. Second thing, God creates Adam, two faces. First, he is a living thought, and then he is creating him. Right. So we have to have an uh, enhancement of our spiritual memory, which is deadened. And the Arimanic forces go around like with huge scissors. Forget this, forget this, forget this. Live in the moment, live now. And that's to make us animals sub subhuman. Animals are wiser because they are still in the cosmic harmony. It's the memory way. That's the, um, you know, the Men in Black movies, they have this little yeah. gadget, they go like this, and it's yeah. a memory yeah. wipe. Yeah. Yeah. If you cut off the, 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 the past, which is also a spiritual past also, of human beings, you can easily manipulate them to oh. anything. And that's they why, don't know. That's why we are forbidden to think. I mean, look at this whole um, tyranny with, uh, with vaccination, with this and that, uh, that we are made to become unthinking idiots. Right. Well, it was funny, you know, I became toxic with heavy metals when I was poisoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it became very, you know, to try and think, yeah. let alone to think conceptually, was very difficult. And I just had to detox the heavy metals. And as I did, once again, I could think. It was quite a Grave experience, but it taught you something deep. So we're going to do a workshop next year. Yeah. And in, uh, in fact, it's going to be on Bach's birthday. Yes. March 21st. Bach's birthday at the same time, the birthday and the death day of Nicolaus of Fleur. Yeah. Who was the greatest individual in Switzerland. Yeah. He was a, stun uh, he was a very important man. But I think also the Swiss, you know, the Swiss population has in a way lost the connection to their own geniuses. Uh huh. It's everywhere. Everywhere. It's part of the trance. Exactly. So we're going to call it a hundred years of deep state tactics. Exactly. Can we understand and transform? Exactly. And you're going to talk about what Steiner said about all the deep state tactics during World War One. Yeah. Yeah, because it's been going on. Oh for, yes. Yeah, oh yes. Centuries. Yep. There are some spicy stories there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, and today, now, we go to the cathedral to see Gideon. Unfortunately, we me... can't take our audience with us. That would be the best. Uh, but no, we, we can we take We make our some audience. pictures. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, we make some. But you're going to explain what you're going to show me with Enoch and Gideon on the portals. Okay. Well, Gideon is here. Yeah. We see Gideon on the north portal, and I'm sure that Robert will make a better photo than this. Uh -huh. This is the first of three Gideon scenes we look at. Uh -huh. Then we are going to look at um, in the north portal. No, that's in the north portal. In the west portal, the main one, the seven liberal arts with the angels, with mm -hmm. the 24 oldest in the apocalypse, the 24. 
sitting around, the four apocalyptic animals. Right. And there are the apostles, no one else, no saint, nothing but Elias and Enoch. Uh -huh. Because the Bible says, are we still recording? Yeah. The Bible says these two were at their deaths directly uh, taken up into the spiritual sphere. Mm -hmm. Enoch and Elias have this in common, nobody else. So I'm very glad to have seen that they, that they had Enoch shows the new, the apocryphic uh, gospels here, which were not allowed for the general public by the church because they were too, too rich, uh, too many unexplicable things. So we're going to look at the portal, and then we're going to look at um, uh, Gideon I've mentioned. Then we're going to look at the window, um, the Chesse window in the West Rose. It's uh, beautiful. Beautiful. So, uh, and then we're going to look at, out of the reasons we have in the interview, we're going to look at one particular episode, that's the Beckett window. Right. It's well preserved. Of the murder of the murder. And then we're going to look at the commemorial plate uh, that um, in what way uh, Beckett was um, connected to Chartres. Uh, and, and the rest is improvisation. No, well, we'll go see the Black Madonna. We're going to see the Madonna, oh. the Black yeah, Madonna, yeah, yeah. and we're going to see the beautiful window, the, yeah. the blue one. Of so to summarize, yes, everybody's busy. Everybody's stressed, everybody's, many things are calling for their attention. Why, I'm listening to this, why, what is Chart to me? Why is Chart present to me an opportunity that can help me in the present age? I would say because some of the impulses here were so far reaching, going beyond a decade, a century, even maybe a millennium, that they had cultivated thought seeds that are still more than 500 years later. Right. So you can link to that. They had a, such a far-reaching spiritual policy that you don't find today. Right. Today, most people just think to tomorrow or next week and politicians think to the next uh, elections. That's, that's their time horizon. And does this time horizon, past-wise and future-wise, was so unlimited, right. you can any time in the future again see, oh, they already had uh, some perspective on this and that in Chartres. And that's why I think it's justifiably so um, admired by people who have the minds a bit waking up. So we should have... So there's a... There's a power here, yeah. and we can plug in. You could also call it like that. Yeah. 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 Better to plug into this than to the subhumanism. I totally agree. <laughs> okay, so we go. We go. We go. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.